Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing empowering low-income students to graduate from college with our special guest, Beth Onofrey, Executive Director of Breakthrough New York. So, uh, Beth, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's so important to end up when a uh, young person enters college, you end up with somebody who actually has gone through the college experience has uh, gotten a degree, obtained useful skills, of course, and is prepared for the job market. And if you take a look at college attendance, graduation, the ability to demonstrate uh, to others, um, not only that you can execute a job, but you have the ability to continue to develop, that's so important. So let's talk about your how you see this problem uh, just by setting it, setting um, up the fact that in America, 60% of American households earn no more than $60,000. 60%, 60% earn no more than $60,000. And the average cost for tuition for four-year public institutions is $10,440. That's for in-state and out-of-state is just exorbitant, two and a half times uh, higher than that. So we have a situation in this country where 60% of our population is structurally sitting on the sidelines from for an education that actually sets up the success of the country, sets up the success of families, sets, sets up the success of individuals. How do you see this, this challenge and how do you confront it at Breakthrough New York? Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for having us today and for um, just bringing attention to this issue. As you as you described, it's pretty stark, the differences between most folks' uh, financial means and, and what it takes to get a college degree financially. Um, and it's, it's absolutely our mission to make sure a college degree is more accessible to students who are particularly from low-income families um, and would otherwise have a challenge achieving that. Um, we know it's so critical for social and economic mobility that with that college degree, as you described, you can go on and, and do so many things and, and really um, create a meaningful career path, but also one that's financially stable for you and your family. Um, it's better for all of us when that happens. And so we're, we're in the business of trying to make those opportunities happen. Um, we recognize there's so many different aspects to getting into and succeeding in college. Um, so we take a particular approach where we start really early with students. We admit students starting in the sixth grade, um, and we see them through 10 years all the way through college graduation. So basically age 12 to 22. Um, it's a long commitment. It's a long time to work together, but we feel like those there's so many decisions and opportunities in their educational pathway between middle and high school and college that are critical for ultimate college success. Um, and part of that is also raising awareness about what it takes to get in, going through the application process, what's financially affordable. So we kind of go through all those details with them. Too. How do you ensure that you're not serving those who are easiest to serve? In other words, you're also serving those who are more difficult to serve. If I take a look at sort of how I grew up and, and my family, right? My family at times eventually evolved to a more prosperous state, but at times were, were, were quite modest. However, you know, my parents came out of a, 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 a um, tradition of literacy. Um, my, my um, uh, both parents had the opportunity to attend school. Um, uh, my mother didn't graduate, but she was a professional woman of, of considerable accomplishment. Right. I might have benefited from your programs, but did I need them? No. Right. How do you ensure that your programs are going to the people who are less convenient to serve for you and, and more challenging? That's a great question. We do it in a couple of different ways. One is through just our admissions criteria. Um, so we are we set income barriers. Um, so they're, you know, families that are above a certain threshold are not admitted to the program. Um, so we are trying to serve the most high need students, um, financially speaking. Um, we do look for students with academic promise and talent. And certainly, you know, our families to opt into this program that requires you to go to school, essentially after school and in the summer, 
they're they're invested in education. So there is a little self-selection connected to that, but that doesn't so mean- motivation that is, a, is a big issue of what you're evaluating, right? Yeah, is, I think so. Really I mean, students- for this. Stu- Yeah, exactly. Students have to want a college degree to be in our program. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the right program for them. But they don't have to have all the skills and even support system around them to be able to achieve that. That's what we provide. Um, and to your point- One of the ways that we try to attract those students and families is by going out to schools across the city. Um, So we're New York City based, but any student in any of the boroughs is open to applying to our program. And we purposely try to reach some under-resourced schools, um, sometimes hard because, uh, um, as you would imagine, guidance counselors and teachers and other folks who would help support students in applying to our program are themselves Um, stretch pretty thin. Um, But so we try to do the outreach and try to support them through the application process. We get to know students and families. While we look at academic performance, um, we really are looking for potential. Um, And so we we try to cast a wide net. Academically, um, they need to be able to be prepared to take on extra work, but at the same time, shouldn't be penalized if there have been barriers in their way to achieving full success. So that's that's what we're aiming to look for and to support in, in the students that we serve. Do you also take a look at the kind of challenges that somebody might have? So if they have executive function skills or they have dyslexia or they have um, a learning circumstance mm-hmm. um, or a, a uh, circumstance that might be just too challenging for your program to, to successfully address, do you try to root those people who you might not be equipped to serve into other programs so that while you might be not be able to serve them, um, other people might be able to. How does that function? Yeah, we. Um, I mean, I think we're we're open to all students. So, like any nonprofit, we have a narrowly focused mission, and um, which means we may not be all things to all people, but we do try to serve students with a range of different learning and emotional needs. Um, that being said, if if our program isn't the right fit for for them, and we don't, you know, we. We only serve so many students. I mean, we have a little over 500 students in our program in total through the 12 year or excuse me, the 10 year program, 12 to 22. So there are many students out there that we're not currently serving and there are other great nonprofits that might be a better fit for them. So for students with more significant learning needs, um, there may be a better fit program out there. And we're lucky to be in a city that has that. So we, we would absolutely help them connect to those now, resources. A 10 year um, involvement is a considerable expense. Could you break down what that involvement looks like? And if you're serving 500 students, we're going to go and take a look at, we're going to break down that that st- student body as well. But let's say I'm, uh, you know, I or or a child of mine or a grandchild of mine enters in on this, on the, uh, as a sixth grader. Mm-hmm. What does that look like over those, those uh, 10 years? Their participation in the programming. Yeah, and, um, and, and the experience that a child, that a family might have, what kind of services do you provide? Sure. I kind of think of it like a, a triangle where it's it's more structured and intensive at the beginning and um, becomes more, I would say, independently oriented as students get older and are carving their own pathways. So in the middle school years, um, students are pretty pretty involved in our program. Obviously, they're, they're going to school during the normal school day and school year, um, but they're attending three summers with us, the summers after sixth, seventh, and eighth grades for five days a week um, for five weeks, all day long, um, math, science, reading and writing classes, plus a lot of enrichment and fun. One of the hallmarks of our program, particularly in that phase, is that um, we have a students teaching students model. So bright, motivated college students from across the country come and kind of learn and practice teaching um, in anticipation of launching their own education careers um, with the support of veteran teachers. So they have this wonderful kind of peer-to-peer model in a way, learning from folks who are off at college. It's really inspiring to hear about their college experiences for our students and certainly to learn from them. So they're doing intensive work over the summer. They continue after school classes twice a week with us during the school year in middle school. And we help them apply to high school. And in New York City, the high school application process is as complicated as applying to college. They fill out forms and um, essays. Parents write essays. They interview. It depends on what type of high school you're applying to. But one of our... um, 
big tenets of our program is to have student agency and choice. And so to do that, we expose all of our students and families to the range of high school options out there. In New York City, there's certainly strong public schools, um, some of which require an exam to take. So we do some test preparation for that. Um, we encourage students to consider parochial schools and also private schools that are both day schools in the city and boarding schools outside of the city. So lots of choices, lots of information we need to share with families so they can figure out the right fit. Um, some of these schools involve financial aid application processes. So we're, we're helping families fill out all of the paperwork and making sure that they have everything complete. So at the end of the process, they can make a good decision. So, so that's just a middle school program. If, if I have, so we're talking about now we're focusing on this, the sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and then going into high school. So yeah. if I have a couple of jobs, if my spouse has a couple of jobs or I'm a single parent, right? If, if I might not even come from an educate, uh, an educational background, maybe I, 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 I didn't graduate uh, college or I don't speak the language. I speak a different language. You're jumping in to provide support that, Another family might already have within their within their family structure, but you're su you're supplying support so that I am not and my kids are not um, transgenerationally disadvantaged just because we can't fill out a form or we can't read it, right? Absolutely. I think it's it's both a generational, um, there's a generational piece to it. There's also kind of a structural piece within the education system because if you're going to under-resourced schools, all the schools in New York City know that students have to apply and go through even just a ranking choice system for high school in the public school system. If you don't have adequate support for going through that process and knowing how it works. Um, so you've got the family piece, you've got the school piece, and we we can come in and support um, with all of the above. Um, and we work in partnership with those organizations and families as well. Schools can still be really supportive and we'll work closely with them to ensure that we're all on the same page and supporting a family through the process. But there are many ways that there could be gaps in that support system. And that's what we aim to fill in. So when, when we're talking about uh, helping individuals, we're going to go over to the high school uh, uh, years as well. But when we're talking about in that early stage, um, because wealth tends to um, align to um, to uh, race and, and other factors, um, do you find that a lot of your uh, people, uh, young people in your program are also, is, is there a racial disparity in that there's a higher level of participation by certain uh, ethnic groups than other ethnic groups? Um, how, how do you see this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, just, Looking demographically at our program, 99% of our students identify as BIPOC or students of color. And so we're working with a really diverse group. But even within that, it's a really diverse group. And I think that speaks to the diversity of New York City. I, I mean, the the range of different um, demographics, backgrounds, um, immigrant groups who've come to the city, the the range of languages our families speak at home. It's 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 wonderful in its diversity and also means that um, we just are resourceful in how we connect families with resources, meaning we don't all speak all the languages that our families speak and, and work together to, to make sure that they're getting all the same information and um, able to navigate the process. Just and as is good. your staff equally as diverse as your, as your students or is it less diverse? How, how is that function? Yeah, um, we are not as diverse as our as our student body. So we have a staff of about 18. Um, and I think currently maybe 60% identify as BIPOC. You know, it's certainly a, a goal of ours. It's a value that we hold and something we, we aim to continue to work on, making sure that our students feel represented in the staff and certainly at the board level too is something we're working on improving. Um, the so this is generally board. New Yorkers helping New Yorkers trying to understand through a mix of staff, lived experience, technical skills, and so on and so forth, trying to uh, keep yourself aligned to the needs of students. But it's New Yorkers hire, helping New Yorkers. It could be male, female, right. identifying as, as, as another uh, group, different orientations, different races, different ages, right? 
Yeah, I would say that's true. I mean, I, I would also say many of our staff, like like many New Yorkers, didn't necessarily grow up here. Um, some have, um, and and so some know the school systems really well from their own personal experiences. Some grew up elsewhere and bring that perspective with them too. But I think ultimately, again, rooting ourselves in student choice, agency, and self knowledge, we we take our cues from them on what their interests are, what their needs are, and and try to respond accordingly. Now, once I get into high school or once um, um, a, a, a young student gets into high school, yeah. your services actually shift because yeah. now you're trying to help prepare them through their high school years for that entry into college. You then will see them through the entry into, co- into college and you'll go beyond. Talk a little bit about how your because that second phase is and then you go through a third phase, right? When somebody is in college, helping them get through. So talk about the second phase and how that actually uh, settles out in terms of your programs. Um, And I should just note, um, one of the the reason that we start with middle school, I I referenced it a little bit earlier, but but want to clarify a little bit. I started my career in college admissions. And so I was used to seeing applications as they came through at that that endpoint in the college admissions process. And I could see the range of different resources and opportunities students had access to, but also the implications of those. You know, if you didn't know that you had to make this choice earlier on, or you didn't have access to that opportunity, it leads you to a certain place, but it can sometimes limit the options that you have later on. And so one of my goals in my professional pathway, but certainly with the structure of our program is is to intervene earlier. And so that critical transition point of where you go to high school and what opportunities high schools, the high school has, has, a, has an impact on future college options. So we wanna ensure that all our students are going to strong college prep schools. And so once they get into those schools and, and talking about the high school phase now, we support students with one-to-one mentorship. Um, we check in with them. We also, we meet as a group, but less frequently. So we are thinking about um, the educational institutions in partnership. Um, So they are offering classes and activities, and we want our students to have the time to be immersed in those experiences. But we also know that it's helpful, especially to come together as a peer group growing through similar experiences. Um, And so we support them with some Saturday programming. Every six weeks, we have what we call Super Saturday, where we do workshops particular to their phase or their, their year in high school. Um, and we we continue to hold workshops that prepare them for um, and, and help support them with applications for different opportunities along the way, like internships, travel abroad experiences, other things that help them figure out what their pathway might look like. Um, and so one of those um, one of those threads, I guess, and, and the series of workshops that we do is obviously directly connected to college applications as well. So as they get into junior year. Um, and certainly in senior year, we're working in depth with them about exposure to different colleges, college fairs, college tours, um, certainly the the nuts and bolts of the applications themselves um, and making sure that they've, you know, they've completed everything they need to and are finding a good foot fit school for them um, where that academic fit, that social fit, but certainly that financial fit and the financially paperwork required for it um, will allow them to not only get in, but to really um, access that opportunity and thrive there. Do you also find that you need to deal with the multilingual aspects so that families and students remain aligned when you have multiple languages spoken? You know, Spanish is spoken in a huge number of uh, New York families, and then there are other Indo-European languages, uh, East Asian languages, and so on and so forth. Um, are, are, are you equipped to deal with, with that aspect, or is that not such a big issue? No, absolutely. I mean, certainly it's not an issue for all of our families, but there are many families in our program for whom um, the, you know, the parents or guardians feel more comfortable speaking a different language than English. And so we do have many members of our staff who are also fluent in Spanish um, and some other languages. But for those that we don't have represented on staff, um, certainly oftentimes students are used to serving as kind of translators, but there are times where it's not appropriate for the student to be the translator. And again, in New York, we 
we have access to Figure other resources out. in the city where where folks have those translation skills. So, um, we, but our goal is to make sure that families feel fully informed and involved in the process too, knowing that again, as students get older, they're gaining independence. This is their process, their journey. Ultimately, they're going to be the major decision makers, but obviously college in particular, and certainly high school, um, those are family decisions too. How many, uh, what proportion of people who enter into your your process at sixth grade fall, um, leave the process before they get to high school? And what what percentage leave the process before they enter college? Yeah, I, there are occasionally times that, um, you know, for whatever reason, it, either the program might not be a fit for a student or family. Um, we've certainly seen some attrition as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, families that have moved out of the city or just found that this isn't kind of an extra time commitment that they can take on. Um, and so, um, I mean, our, our aim is to have 95% uh, retention year over year. Um, and we've hovered a, a little bit around that depending on, again, some of these different variables, but our goal is to, to persist as many students as we can through that program. Now, once we go through the college application process, which I'm sure you you help as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And so let's say I've gone through the college application process and I'm, I'm entering college. Now, very often that first year or first 18 months is really tough, right? Yep. You've got to figure out where you fit into a different society. You're, you're away from your familiar environment. Um, if you're if you have the option of living uh, on campus, there's there are that complexities that the changing relationships as a young person grows into their family and they might not be meeting their their expectations is defined by their family. They have their own path. Everything that we we all have have lived through. That is a really complicated time. How do you how do you help people navigate in that way, but also respect their individuality? And their own agency. Absolutely. Um, we, again, um, kind of a through line of our program is this peer to peer mentorship. And so we are near peer mentorship, I should say. Um, and so we connect every college student with what we call a college coach, um, a volunteer who's partnered with them based on shared interests and um, maybe career goals. Um, but it's someone who's already graduated from college and is off. Um, kind of navigating the working world uh, to serve as a, a role model to them. But also, they don't all know what it's like to, they know what it's like to go through that experience. They don't know what it's like to necessarily guide someone through this process. And so we make sure that our professional staff um, are there to support them through these, you know, these are the the things that they're that are on their radar right now, they need to make sure they're uh, registering for classes or declaring a major, whatever's happening at that particular time. These are financial aid deadlines, um, making sure they're on top of that and then know how to support them through those things. But we also have additional layers of support. So there can be a variety of larger challenges that students face, um, financial hiccups that come up or barriers that may seem insurmountable that um, a small grant or stipend from us may be able to help mitigate. Maybe it's the cost of books that is proving challenging, um, but something like our organization can support that. Um, sometimes mental health challenges arise. Um, just difficulty, as you said, adjusting to college life. There could be challenges at home that are weighing on a, a student. Um, so we have um, a, a licensed social worker on our team, but also can refer out whether it's to campus resources or local resources in the city um, to make sure students are, are receiving support. And that's true for students at any age, um, but certainly with the unique transitions that happen or the challenges that arise at college, um, we want to be mindful of that in particular. So we've got kind of major structures and, and programming in place to support students through their individual pathways, but also these added layers of support as needed. As, as a young person gets toward graduation and their, their, their minds are thinking, you know, now what? Now I guess yeah. I have to find a job. Yep. Oh my goodness. Right. <laughs> um, how does how how do you support people as they as they approach that time, and how do you celebrate their accomplishment when they do accomplish this? Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, we actually start um, career readiness from the get go. So we do something called career days, even in our middle school summer program. I mean, there are so many different types of jobs out there, different industries in New York itself, let alone 
you know, globally. Um, so we start out with some field trips to different places around the city, different types of jobs um, for students to just learn what's out there. Um, obviously, we support students then as they get older through high school and through college in finding opportunities that are more particular to their interests through internships, job shadowing, things like that, um, other sorts of panels and workshops we can provide, again, to um, add to their exposure and then also build their professional skills. Um, this past summer, we did um, a networking workshop um, with some of our partner institutions. Um, we have done resume review workshops, things like that, that just ensure that students have the range of skills that help you access and thrive in the workforce. Um, and then again, with the college coaches, as they get toward, um, as they go through their college career and toward the end of it, both ensuring that they're all set to graduate, they've done all the things they need to do for that, um, but then are, are thinking through what the pathways are beyond. Um, we can help them learn about different job opportunities and certainly support their connection to resources on campus. Um, and then are excited to celebrate with them. We have a college graduation celebration at the end of it all where we get the class back together. So that's, it's been virtual over the past couple of years. We're excited to have, have all of these things back in person again now. It's so it's so wonderful how your organization breaks down the various phases of the challenge that students have. And you've sort of carved out an area where you can provide appropriate support. Um, each person is individual. So these are categories of support that you can provide. But I'm sure that as you provide that support, it takes different uh, guises um, for each individual. And, and the match is going to be uh, be different. But it is a it really is a parental and and young person support operation that you have to ensure that the mix of people coming out of these universities and colleges that mix reflects society and we don't have a a a underclass that is created simply because of embedded and systemic uh, disparity that exists within society we exist within any society Absolutely. No, it's critical. I mean, these opportunities need to be accessible to everyone and, and they're currently not. And I know there are many institutions trying in many different ways to, to remedy that. And, and we're proud to be part of that solution. And Beth, are you trying to scale the organization to serve more people going into the future? Or are you finding it difficult to sustain where you are? What does the future hold for Breakthrough New York? Yeah, we we are absolutely um, hoping to grow in the near future. I think over the past couple of years, um, there's been just many things that we've had to adjust to, uh, transitioning to virtual programming and so on, and wanting to sustain through even some economic ups and downs. Um, broadly speaking, we're proud to be um, in a stable and strong place at the moment and, and really are they're looking forward to growing. Um, so we are putting in place additional resources to expand our admissions outreach um, and to start to scale our program to serve twice as many students in the coming years. And talk about an amazing return on investment. Investing in a child's education creates a world of opportunity for that child, their family, their community, and the country and the world. Uh, Beth uh, Onofre, thank you so much um, for sharing your work as executive director uh, of, uh, of Breakthrough New York. Thank you so much for the work that your staff does, your, your, your 18 people, your volunteers, your board, your funders. It is so very important to making the country strong that you're helping these 500 people, 500 people over and over and over again, that resonance for, for New York and for the country is, is so significant. We so appreciate your sharing your work with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the work you do supporting nonprofits like ours. And thank you so much for this opportunity to share our work today.